Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. OK. Hi. So um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to spend uh, most of this talk unpacking the title. I tried to put all the important words into the title. Um, this group of people, um, the people I mostly work with on what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge the National Science Foundation, which has been funding my research for, for many years. So the plan of this talk is I'd like to, to tell you uh, who I am, more of the uh, real story. Uh, and then I'm gonna give a very short course on astrophysical plasmas um, and a slightly longer course on cosmic rays and cosmic rays and galactic and extragalactic ecosystems. So especially because this talk spans so many fields, uh, really feel free to ask questions if you're not sure uh, what, what I mean. Okay, so how did I get here? So um, like many people uh, who became astronomers, I decided when I was a kid that I wanted to be an astronomer. And initially it was uh, sort of an, oh, wow. But then as I read more and more, I really fell in love with the idea that, that we live in a universe that's ruled by just a few natural laws that can explain this host of complex phenomena. And I'm still in love with it. So I went to University of Chicago. Um, I majored in math. It would have been more logical to major in physics, but I'm very poor in the lab. Uh, and I was socially awkward in this very un gender imbalanced um, environment. But I had two wonderful mentors, uh, professors of astronomy, Pat Palmer and Peter Vanderfort. And somehow they, they encouraged me and I persisted. And when I was in college, uh, still in college, I discovered plasma physics through this little book of notes on a course by Chandra Sekhar. Um, and it just seemed that all the subjects I was studying in physics were coming together uh, in, in plasma physics. But I was also very interested in general relativity and I went to Princeton to study that, but then I switched to plasma physics and uh, now we do both plasma physics and general relativity together. It's actually a rapidly advancing subject, although I'm not gonna talk about it. Um, and I met many inspiring people in graduate school, uh, including uh, Maria Teresa Ruiz, who's, um, I don't think she needs an introduction to you. She was uh, just finishing up the year that I joined. And um, I, was, I was very happy uh, to, to get to know her and be, in the same department, if only for a year. Okay, so that's who I am and how I got here. And now let's do some plasma physics. Okay, so, so what actually is a plasma? Well, um, one charged particle by itself is not a plasma and two, not a plasma either. And you have to get enough charged particles together per volume that they're capable of moving around is mostly, but not always the electrons being so light that, that do all the readjusting to rearrange their density in a way that screens out electric fields and freezes in magnetic fields. Um, the most common plasmas are gases, but they don't ha doesn't have to be a gas. Uh, you can have uh, liquid plasmas and solid plasmas. For example, liquid metals uh, turn out to be a wonderful laboratory plasma system for studying things like generation of magnetic fields by dynamos. So what's an astrophysical plasma? Well, um, I guess I would turn the question around and say what astrophysical system is, is not a plasma? So pretty much anything uh, that you encounter in astrophysics, be it uh, the, ap the ionosphere of a planet, a star, a galaxy, a cluster of galaxies, is a plasma in that there are enough charged particles per volume to behave in this way. And here are just a few examples. Um, this is the flaring sun. This is the limb of the sun. And these bright loops are hot plasma emitting in the X-rays and they outline the morphology of the magnetic field. So it's this kind of arch-like morphology. Um, you may have heard of the antenna galaxies, one of the earliest galaxies uh, known to actually be a merger where one galaxy disrupts another, draws this tidal tail. But here's a view of the magnetic field in the antenna. This is some work I was involved in about five years ago. 
the magnetic field is stretched out by the tidal forces and actually amplified. It's three or four times as strong as the magnetic field in our galaxy. So this is the scale of a star. This is a galaxy. And this is taking place in a whole cluster of galaxies. These are radio jets that are powered by the supermassive central black hole in the Hercules cluster. So this is extending, extending over megaparsecs, millions of light years, all, all plasmas. And astrophysical plasmas are, are very exotic. Here's uh, an X-ray view of the pulsar, crab pulsar wind nebula. You can see the rotation. You can see things wrapped around. You can see little jets. This is a computer simulation of a magnetic field generated by crust, the currents in the crust of a neutron star. And it's developed this very complex topology due to the electrons in the crust uh, behaving like a plasma. The ions are held in place by lattice forces. The electrons are free to move around and their currents create this beautifully complex magnetic field. And astrophysical plasmas are extreme. So there are, there are dimensionless parameters that describe how a plasma will behave that you can translate from plasma to plasma throughout the universe. And a very important one is the so-called Lundquist number, which is defined as the ratio of the time it takes electric currents to decay by ordinary resistivity divided by something called the Alphane travel time, which I've um, defined down here. So there's a type of wave that's driven by magnetic forces, analogous to a sound wave driven by pressure forces. And it moves at this characteristic speed, VA, which you're going to see again throughout this talk. It's the strength of the magnetic field divided by four pi, I'm working in Gaussian CGS units, uh, times the mass density. So this is mass per volume, take the square root of it. This has the dimensions of speed. So in a laboratory plasma or in uh, a good computer model, the Lundquist number might be about 10,000. If you estimate it for a loop in the solar corona, like the one I showed an image of a few slides back, it might be 10 to the 10. And if you estimate it for the magnetic field of our galaxy, it's about 10 to the 21. So galaxies are superconductors beyond the, the wildest dreams of any condensed matter physicist. And this means that you really, to do um, plasma astrophysics, you have to kind of cross your fingers and have some nerve and extrapolate what we know from laboratory evidence or direct numerical modeling, extrapolate it to very extreme parameters. And um, I enjoy doing this. And there's also kind of a, a little core of cross-cutting processes that we see in many different astrophysical settings. And one of them is magnetic reconnection, which converts magnetic energy to plasma energy. And it changes the topology or the connectivity of the magnetic field. And this powers solar flares, pulsar wind nebula flares, and the evolution of the galactic magnetic field. So it shows up all over the place. This is just a partial list. Then particle acceleration. So there are many astrophysical environments. And of course, I'm going to talk about cosmic rays. Uh, so this leads directly in where, contrary to what you learn in thermodynamics, where particles follow a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, most of them follow a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, but there's a tiny minority that has enormous energy relative to the average energy. So how, how does that happen? And then a third one I selected is, is dynamos. So how magnetic induction allows the energy in a flow, for example, the rotation or turbulence in a galaxy or in a star to be converted to magnetic energy. And uh, this, this is what allows galaxies to have magnetic fields. It, it's what produces the solar cycle. And there may even be magnetic fields on intergalactic scales. This is still an unstudied process. So we can study these basic processes uh, in the lab through computer simulations. We can observe their consequences. But in the end, to, to apply them in astrophysics, we have to extrapolate them over, over many orders of magnitude. So this example will come up again. Um, so this is what's called magnetic buoyancy. 
So if you have a region where gas that's sitting in a gravitational field, uh, where the magnetic field becomes very strong, um, some of the gas is driven out. Magnetic pressure replaces gas pressure. Therefore, the density is lower and this, the over-magnetized region will, will rise. Uh, here's another close-up image of a sunspot pair connected by arch-like magnetic fields. And we think what has happened is that here's this, imagine this as the field below the surface. Well, it buoyantly kind of bubbled up here, creating these sunspots. Here it's happening on galactic scales. Uh, this is a cartoon from a fundamental paper by uh, Gene Parker published way back in the 1960s, where he's uh, conjecturing that the same thing happens in galaxies and allows the magnetic field to bubble up and escape. And later on in this talk, I'll show you some uh, computer simulations that my group has, has done in the past couple of years that um, kind of modernize Parker's ideas. Okay, that's astrophysical plasmas. Let's go on to galaxies. So, um, Here's a nice image of M31, the closest large spiral galaxy to us. And the distance from here to here is about 30,000 light years. Um, there's about a um, hundred billion uh, solar masses of visible material, uh, which is mostly stars. Um, a few percent of it is gas, maybe one or 2%, which is mostly hydrogen. Uh, there's a central black hole, uh, which we know not because it's active and actively accreting, so there's no jet in M31, but we can tell from the motions of stars that there must be a very strong gravitational field here due to a black hole. And then um, most of the matter in M31 and in galaxies like the Milky Way, um, we cannot see. It forms a massive dark matter halo that's at least 10 times as massive as the mass in stars. So the main thing to remember about this image is its scale, 30,000 light years. So what about our own galaxy? So here's the composite that shows what happens if we look in the plane of our galaxy towards the center of the galaxy. Is there a question? OK. Um, if there is a question, please go ahead. So. So here are several different views at different wavelengths. Uh, so here and here, um, cosmic ray electrons producing both some gamma rays and some radio synchrotron radiation. Um, X-ray emitting gas was heated by supernova explosions. Infrared is radiated by dust that's heated by starlight. And the starlight is obscured at visible wavelengths from dust. And here's a gamma ray image, which tells us that cosmic ray protons are present too. Notice that all these images of the galactic plane, the emission is kind of concentrated near the center. So the center is the, denti is the densest, that's where most of the matter is, that's where most of the action is. And we can see with multi-wavelength observations, we can see uh, what's going on in all these different components of the interstellar medium. So from the point of view of physics, what is going on? So what, how is energy flowing in a galaxy? Where is most of the energy sit? And how does it show up as visible emission? Well, overwhelmingly, uh, galaxies are gravitating objects. So there's a large scale gravitational field that's associated with both the visible and the invisible matter. And then there's the gravitational binding energy of, of stars. And for talking about cosmic rays, it's actually mostly the gravitational binding energy of stars that we need to talk about. So when a, a massive star, when the core of a massive star collapses, causing a supernova, there's about 10 to the 53 ergs of gravitational binding energy that's released. So there's, a, there's kind of an oddity about cosmic ray physics, which is that although I, say almost everything in Gaussian CGS units. So I talk about the energy unit being an erg. Uh, we talk about cosmic rays in electron volts. So I'll come back to that, but that's just kind of the way it's done. 
Okay, so of that 10 to the 53 ergs, about 99% is emitted as neutrinos. And neutrinos uh, barely interact with anything, so that energy freely escapes. But about 1% of it um, comes out in the form of high velocity, extremely hot gas, 10 to the 51 ergs, that drives a very fast shock into the surrounding medium. And about 10% of that shock, so about a tenth of a percent of the gravitational binding energy of this neutron star, if that's what's formed, um, goes into particles which become relativistic cosmic rays. So in a supernova explosion, 1% of the energy comes out in a, a form that impacts the surrounding medium, and 10% of that 1% goes into cosmic rays. And I've selected this picture of a supernova remnant. This is Tycho, supernova remnant uh, 10,006, because of this very sharp X-ray rim, which turns out to be a site of particle acceleration that I'll discuss in a few minutes. So um, the Milky Way is, is kind of a sleepy place uh, compared to starburst galaxies. Uh, we're also challenged to explain things like this. So this is, a galaxy called M82. It's called a starburst galaxy because there's an intense rate of star formation within just a few hundred light years of the center of this galaxy. About as much star formation is occurring in this little volume as there is in the whole disk of our galaxy. And the energy put out by supernovae and winds from these massive stars is driving this huge outflow out of the galaxy, which is so the blue here represents X-rays. So some of this gas is very hot, but some of this gas is much cooler. So this might be 10 million degree gas. This is 10,000 degree gas, all mixed together. And then here's the disk of the galaxy itself. And recently I, I had the opportunity to be part of some far infrared polarimetry observations of the central region of M82. And these filaments, show the orientation of the magnetic field. It's being dragged out of the center regions of this galaxy by, uh, by the wind, which is just what plasma physics predicts. So that's gratifying. So we can say a little bit more about galactic magnetic fields. So one of the primary ways of mapping galactic magnetic fields is through synchrotron radiation from cosmic ray electrons. So if you haven't met synchrotron radiation before, uh, this is kind of how it works. Uh, so this black line is a magnetic field line. This um, should be a lot more regular, but I don't draw very well on PowerPoint. This is the helical orbit of a relativistic electron. And as it's continuously accelerated, as it gyrates around this magnetic field, it emits a highly beamed cone of radiation, which is going off like this in galactic magnetic fields. So the frequency and the power are proportional to the strength of the magnetic field and the square of the energy of the electron. But with typical magnetic field strengths and cosmic ray electron energies in galaxies, this comes out at radio frequencies. And we can use the polarization of this synchrotron radiation to map uh, the magnetic field. So here's the galaxy M51, and you can see that there's a very strong spiral-like magnetic field that actually is lined up with the spiral arms, which you can see. Um, so they're very intense in the radio, and that shows up as black. And this is done by a former postdoc in my group, Ann Mao. Okay, so now let's drill a little deeper on cosmic rays. So Cosmic rays uh, were formally discovered and named uh, back in 1911 or 1912, but it had been known really since the 18th century that something was ionizing the atmosphere. So this was observed and it was not explained. And one of the hardest things in science, if you become a professional scientist or actually in life is Understand is figuring out when a detail is worth following up. Is there an extra penny in your wallet? No, it's probably not worth following up. Um, but some things are worth following up. 
And this question of what is ionizing the atmosphere of the Earth, and it's a very low level. Um, the Earth's atmosphere is not a highly conducting plasma. This, this kind of nagged away at people. And by the beginning of the 20th century, uh, radioactivity had been discovered. And there were they had pretty much narrowed it down to two possibilities. One, something coming from the sky, wasn't clear what, and two, uh, something coming from the earth. So the first person uh, that I know of who tested this idea, tried it by climbing the Eiffel Tower. So this was a late 19th century experiment that was as high as anybody could go. And the atmospheric ionization at the top of the Eiffel Tower in Paris uh, was about the same as it was on the ground. So he could not conclude anything. But in 1911, uh, an Austrian physicist, Victor Hess, uh, ascended, he went up five kilometers in a balloon, test with bringing this little electroscope that measured the rate of ionization. And he showed that as he went higher and higher, and five kilometers is a uh, significant height, that the ionization increases with height. Here he's come back to earth and he's surrounded by excited people. Then it wasn't clear whether this source of ionizing radiation was coming from the sun or coming kind of from the general cosmos. So fortunately a solar eclipse was coming and he went up again. And even though the sun was covered, ionization increased as he went upward. And this work was eventually uh, recognized with a Nobel prize. But whenever work is considered is deemed important enough to win a Nobel Prize, a lot of other people have been working on it and continue to work on it. And so it was really the work of many. And I've just selected four people who continued to accumulate observational evidence of cosmic rays. So one way is particle tracks in plastic. Um, here are a couple of examples. It can be done on the ground. It can be done from space. Um, I wouldn't have enough slides to fill with everybody's picture, but it's really the work of many that have filled out um, our knowledge of cosmic rays. And you can also see that here. This is the spectrum, the energy spectrum of cosmic rays. So here, as promised, uh, giga electron volts, electron volts. So the rest mass of a proton is about one giga electron volt that's over here. And this plot goes all the way out to 10 to the 12 giga electron volts. So the very best tennis players in the world uh, can hit a tennis ball uh, with about 10 to the 12 uh, giga electron volts, although they're not usually measured that way. Uh, but nature does it itself with single particles, single nuclei. Uh, and so this is the number multiplied by the square of the energy. So it all fits on one scale. Um, and this is the frequency. Um, so at this energy, so 10 to the five giga electron volts, um, if you put out a one meter square detector, you will on average have to wait for about a year to detect one of these particles. And if you take that one square meter detector and sit next to it for 100 years, uh, you might detect one of these particles. So the solution, obviously, is to build enormous detectors. And so there is one uh, called Auger in Argentina. Uh, there, was a, there was a plan, which has never been fulfilled, to build one in the north as well. So it's in the south. It could be in the north. This is broken down by contribution. Um, here are the electrons. There are fewer electrons than protons. And there are some positrons. And there are even a few antiprotons. And one of the things that I like about this slide is it shows you the vast number of experiments that have been made to fill out this cosmic ray spectrum. So cosmic rays are mostly protons. The energy density in the Milky Way of our galaxy is about one electron volt per cubic centimeter, which is about the same as the energy density of the galactic magnetic field, the thermal energy of the gas, and even the energy density in the radiation field. But even though the energies are the same, 
only about one interstellar particle in a billion is a cosmic ray. So to translate this into something a little more down to earth, it's as if the room you were sitting in, if the average temperature in the room you were sitting in dropped by a factor of two, okay? But that energy went into one particle in a billion, which became so energetic that hitting you would actually be dangerous. Okay, so that is the interstellar environment of our galaxy, and as far as we know, all similar galaxies. Cold room with dangerous particles. Okay, so we can go a little further with the properties of cosmic rays. So, and I don't have time to explain why we know these things, but you can ask me questions about them. But it seems that cosmic rays, rather than continuously being accelerated in the galaxy, are accelerated, get most of their energy in kind of one-time events that produce an e to the minus two spectrum. So that means that the spectrum you would have seen if we were looking at the spectrum at the source would be much flatter. At a, at a giga electron volt, a GeV, cosmic rays are confined by the Milky Way magnetic field. So spiraling around magnetic field lines, for about 20 million years, and they're scattered up and down the field lines with a relatively short mean free path of about one parsec or three light years. And if we take this 10% of non neutrino supernova energy, if we take it seriously, that is enough. That's a strong enough source given the supernova rate in our galaxy that, that balances the rate at which cosmic rays are lost. So that's kind of a broad brush picture of the properties of cosmic rays. Okay, so where are they accelerated? So this is called a, a Hillis plot, because it was first made and, and popularized by, by Tony Hillis. And the basic idea behind this plot, so what's going on here is we see kind of a size, a characteristic size of a system. So a neutron star is about 10 kilometers. Uh, Cluster of galaxies is more like a, a mega parsec. Okay. Um, so the idea is that if you have a system of a certain size that's somehow accelerating particles, it doesn't matter how, as those particles acquire more and more energy, their gyro radius in the magnetic field of that system becomes larger and larger. And when it becomes equal to the size of the system, the particle just gyrates out and escapes. So you cannot accelerate particles beyond um, an energy that corresponds where their gyro radius corresponds to their size. And so another way to say this is that very tiny sources like neutron stars um, must have very strong magnetic fields here, 10 to the 12 Gauss uh, to make a proton at 10 to the 20th electron volts. So 10 to the 11 giga electron volts, a so-called ultra high energy cosmic ray. It can be a little bit lower if those very highest energy cosmic rays were, were iron. And you can kind of see um, as you go to larger and larger systems, you can get away with weaker and weaker magnetic fields. So for example, the galactic halo, which has a size of about 10 to 100 kiloparsecs, the magnetic field can be about a micro gauss. Um, and that's lucky because that is what it's about. Galactic magnetic fields are typically a few micro gauss. But there's another requirement, which is that the system has to live long enough to accelerate particles uh, to that energy. And so our galaxy probably has a wind, a constant outflow of material. And at some point that wind joins the interstellar medium, uh, sorry, the intergalactic medium at a so-called termination shock. So there's a termination shock that bounds our solar system and a termination shock that bounds the galaxy. And so this shock is huge. And based on the Hellas criterion alone, it could accelerate particles to the very highest energies. But if you make even the most favorable assumptions for how fast this happens, the wind has to exist for a whole Hubble time 
the age of the universe in order to accelerate particles to these energies. So that helps us narrow it down, the site of acceleration. And we now think that up to about 1,000 uh, GeV, cosmic rays are made in young supernova remnants. So um, here's a close-up now of supernova 1006. Uh, the blue represents X-rays. You can see how sharp, beautifully defined this is. And we think that this is a shock front. Uh, so the shock is being driven by the sudden burst of energy that went in in the form of a supernova. And what happens uh, if we sit in a frame where the shock is at rest, instead of moving at several thousand kilometers a second, uh, the shock is rushing in at, as indicated by this long black arrow. And some of the energy uh, that's represented by this is turned to heat. And so it leaves at a slower rate and the magnetic field lines get sort of refracted in this way. Okay, so how does that lead to acceleration of particles? Well, um, and Professor uh, Rick Helme is did fundamental work in this area. So um, instead of drawing the field lines as completely straight, so now I've just taken the shock picture and changed the geometry a little bit. Um, so here's the kind of background magnetic field. And here's some little wiggles on the field. I haven't talked to you yet about how cosmic rays interact with them, but if a cosmic ray uh, comes in, so say it comes in from here and it bounces off one of these little kinks in the magnetic field, uh, which is moving away from it, it will lose, it will lose some energy. Particle will lose some energy but it'll also be reflected back. And now as it goes up, it might meet another fluctuation, say this one, and it will reflect off that one and it will gain some energy. So if you collide with, um, a, move, with, with a wall that's moving toward you, um, you, uh, you're, you bounce back a lot harder than if you run after a wall that's moving away from you, collide with that, if you should do such a thing. So, Particles gain more energy than they lose as they cross and recross the shock. And this leads to that e to the minus two spectrum that we were looking for. And this seems to work, uh, given the ages of supernova remnants, this seems to work up to uh, 10 to the six GeV. So a peta electron volt. So that's where most of the cosmic rays come from, but not the most energetic ones. So now let's turn to what cosmic rays do in galaxies. And this is, the, this is a, a, what we call a multi-scale problem. And what we mean by that is, so here's that image of M31 again, and I've sketched on it um, what the magnetic field of the galaxy looks like. So it, it kind of confined to the galactic plane. It's, kind of goes around in the same direction as rotation, but it's got some irregularities and it's a few microgauss. And the overall scale here, as we said before, is about 30,000 light years or 10 to the four parsecs. And cosmic rays are gyrating around these field lines and the size of a cosmic ray orbit, a so cosmic sure. ray, yeah, is there a question? Um, the size of a cosmic ray orbit uh, is about a 10th of one astronomical unit. So to actually solve for the detailed orbits of cosmic rays, even if we knew exactly where the magnetic field went, which we don't, um, is, is just impossible. It's impossible now and it will, I will go out on a limb and say it'll always be impossible no matter how good we get at computing. So we can't treat cosmic rays as individual particles. We have to treat them as collectively as some kind of fluid. And that is where the plasma physics of cosmic rays really starts coming in. So in order to understand how cosmic rays can behave like a fluid, uh, we have to talk about how cosmic rays interact with the thermal gas in the galaxy mediated by the magnetic field of the galaxy. So um, let's begin with some analogies. 
So um, extreme mountain biking, extreme surfing. So um, you can ride on a road that has hills and you kind of stick to the road and you can ride over a, a road that's rough and you know your hands may vibrate a little bit, your bike vibrates a little bit, but you know it's basically okay. But if you hit a rut in the road, which is about as big as, as your wheelbase, uh, you'll interact strongly with that. Similarly with surfing, uh, if you're very skillful, you can ride a big wave like this, you can surf over little ripples, but if two waves are separated by the length of your surfboard, that's, uh, that's where it gets tricky. And this is also true, so I hope you're feeling this in your bones, um, because it's also true for the way cosmic rays interact with magnetic fluctuations. So let's, um, let's go to that. So now here's a magnetic field line, this red thing here, and it's got gentle curves and it's got tiny wiggles in it. And here in black, this helix is the orbit of a cosmic ray. And, you know, it sticks to the field line pretty well. And these little wiggles kind of average out over an orbit. Uh, so not much happens. But if we meet a fluctuation where the wavelength of this little kink, instead of being very tiny compared to a gyro radius, is exactly the same size, um, the cosmic ray will experience a strong interaction. It's like a resonantly driven harmonic oscillator that you've probably seen in physics. And we can estimate the scattering rate from kind of a geometric argument. So here's our field without the wave. Here's our field with the wave. There's an amplitude delta theta, uh, which is delta B over B. And every time a particle interacts with one of these waves, it's scattered by an amount delta theta, but it's scattered in a random direction. So it's like a random walk. And if we have many waves that are incoherent, uh, it will scatter you know, sort of once per gyro orbit. And if we put these things together and apply a theory of random walk, we come up with a scattering frequency, which is the gyro frequency times the average angle squared. And there's very little energy change associated with this scattering process, but it mostly just changes direction. So through very frequent scattering, um, cosmic rays begin to be described like a, like a fluid, like something that diffuses. Um, so there are a couple of different theories over where these waves come from. So these waves are tiny scale, they're subsolar system scale, we can't directly observe them. Um, so there are two theories. One is that they're just kind of there as part of a general interstellar turbulent cascade. And the other is that they're made by the cosmic rays themselves. And I'm gonna concentrate on this theory because I think it's the correct theory. Uh, and I think, and it's also kind of the richer theory that, that makes more predictions. So the rate at which cosmic rays amplify a wave through the scattering process. So when a cosmic ray scatters, it exchanges momentum and energy with that wave. And this over time leads, allows the waves to grow. And they grow at a rate, which, uh, and I won't try to derive this, they grow at a rate, which is the cyclotron frequency of a proton. So this is very fast. You know, a typical proton in the interstellar medium makes gyrations in, in about a minute. But this number is very small. This number is about 10 to the minus nine or 10 to the minus 10. This is kind of the prevailing speed of the whole cosmic ray fluid. So if you have more cosmic rays going to the right than to the left, the average speed will be some velocity, which we call here VD. And if it's greater than VA, this magnetic wave speed, uh, the waves will grow. Okay, now, this, I'm just putting this up for those of you who know a little kinetic theory, um, but it's not a prerequisite for the rest of this talk. If we calculate the back reaction of the waves on the cosmic ray distribution function, it this very complicated expression here sort of beautifully simplifies into a diffusion equation in momentum space. And the main, so the main source of diffusion is angular scattering as we derive from a geometric argument and 
our geometric argument leads to the right weight, right rate. So there's a legitimate derivation of what I showed you kind of approximately. To keep track of energy flow, we can take that equation on the previous slide, multiply it by particle energy and integrate all of, over all the particles. And that tells us that the time rate of change of the energy density in cosmic rays is equal to minus the divergence of the energy flux. So that's kind of a typical flux equation. But then there's this other term, which represents, so this is the energy in waves, and this is the rate at which energy is being fed into the waves by cosmic rays. So as this right hand stands, um, it's pretty useless. So if you think it looks useless, um, you're right, it does look useless. But there's a major simplification if we assume that cosmic rays are scattered with a very short mean free path compared to kind of the global scale of the system. And without too many, um, without too much additional math, we can write this kind of inscrutable energy transfer equation in this form. It's the alphane speed dotted with the cosmic ray pressure gradient. So this looks like some kind of frictional heating. It says that the cosmic rays are moving down their pressure gradient at the alphane speed, this magnetic wave speed relative to the gas. And they're doing work on the gas, exerting a force, which is the gradient of the cosmic ray pressure. And this is transferring energy to the gas. And this is not just energy, it's actually heat. So in addition to exerting a pressure gradient force, so what happens is the cosmic rays transfer momentum to the waves, and then the waves transfer that momentum to the background, and the cosmic rays transfer energy to the waves, and the waves transfer energy to the thermal background. So through this mediation by tiny scale magnetic fluctuations, cosmic rays transfer energy and momentum to the thermal gas. And the thermal gas can transfer that energy right back. Okay. So this picture was uh, developed and made mathematically precise and computationally useful, uh, beginning with Heinz Folk and his collaborators. Um, they were interested in primarily in cosmic ray acceleration and shocks. And this is a summary of what I just wrote down. And these equations that were initially derived by Heinz Folk were um, applied, they've been applied to shock waves in the interstellar medium. The heating turns out to be interesting in both galaxies and galaxy clusters. Global instabilities, which I'll describe, turn out to be important, uh, drive galaxy winds and actually even help with galaxy formation and evolution. So here's an example of what I mean. This is some work that uh, I did in uh, 2017 with Mateusz Roskowski and Karen Yang, uh, then at Michigan. This is an edge on view of a model galaxy forming. Uh, this color field is density. And in this particular numerical simulation, we didn't put in this streaming down the magnetic field lines at the alphane speed, we just assume that the cosmic rays are frozen to the gas. And in that, in that treatment, they, they provide some pressure, which kind of puffs up the gas, but the gas layer is too heavy to lift very far. So you just get this kind of puffed up disk. If you allow the cosmic rays to stream at the alphane speed, they become distributed enough that they drive this immense wind. So here, uh, this huge wind has been blown out of the galaxy primarily by cosmic ray pressure and cosmic ray heat. And so it's very important to decide which treatment is, is most accurate, which one better describes what's going on in the interstellar medium, this one or this one. Their consequences are obviously dramatically different. Ellen, uh, yeah. so uh, how dependent is that result on the configuration of the initial magnetic field? Did you see any? Yeah, good, good question. So, um, so we start with a magnetic field that's tangent to the galactic plane, which is mostly what we observe. And I didn't include a figure in the talk, but there is a figure in our paper that's kind of a close up of the magnetic field in this area. And what happens is if the cosmic rays can exert enough of a force, 
they drag out the gas with the magnetic field. So it's really, to the extent that this model applies, uh, and I'll say a little bit about some reasons why it might not apply um, when I get to galaxy clusters in a few minutes, uh, it, it seems to, you know, if you put in enough, if you have enough star formation and enough cosmic rays, it does, it does seem to work. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, good, thanks. Um, okay, so you have this layer of gas that's puffed up by the cosmic rays. And this is exactly the kind of situation that Gene Parker said was dangerous. So here's a close up of the cartoon from his paper. So what's happened here is that we started with a magnetic field that was tangent to the plane of the galaxy, but it, it rippled up a little bit. And as it rippled, gas slid down the field lines into these pockets, which formed dense clouds. And the magnetic flux tubes became buoyant and continued to rise. And Parker suggested that this was actually a key ingredient in forming clouds and also um, driving, uh, driving the magnetic field out of the galaxy if the magnetic field became too strong. So I've revisited this, this picture um, with uh, a couple, actually now a couple of generations of students. Uh, here's an image from a, of a Parker unstable galactic gas layer that was made by Chad Bustard and, and Evan Heinz. So Chad has graduated. He's uh, now a postdoc at the KITP and Evan is finishing up this year. And um, you can see the magnetic field lines going into these arches. Uh, you can see here where it's dense. You can see here low density, high density, and the magnetic field is drawn here. And uh, Rourke Hobbiger, a uh, new PhD student, uh, is investigating kind of a, a wrinkle on this model. And Sherry Wong, an undergraduate student, um, started last year and is continuing evaluating the effect of some structures that appear late in these simulations. So um, this these simulations and successive simulations have turned out to be kind of very rich in, in physics. And we can go even further with this. And now, um, so this is kind of a, um, a trailer for work that Francisco is doing. So you can invite him, uh, you can invite him to give one of these talks. Um, so Francisco's next door, I think. Uh, so I hope he's reacting well. So, here is an X-ray image of a galaxy cluster. So basically every fuzzy blob that you see in here is a galaxy and it's brightest and densest. So it's filled with this hot gas, 10 to the seven to 10 to the eighth degrees. And um, what keeps it hot is an interesting problem that Francisco's work is um, will impact and um, then as you go away, it uh, gets less dense. And we know from radio synchrotron evidence that this galaxy cluster is also full of cosmic rays. And here um, I've taken some artistic license and sketched in what we know is a very tangled magnetic field. So now um, cosmic rays might leave uh, the center of the cluster where most of the acceleration presumably is. And they, they travel out they, the gas is getting less dense, uh, they're getting less dense. Then eventually they start to come back and they start moving up this density gradient. And this creates kind of a slowdown because they're moving at the alphane speed and the higher the density, the smaller the alphane speed. So it's like being on a super highway and then one lane is closed down. What happens? Traffic backs up. Backs up deal with this every time I get in a car, which is as rarely as possible. So, um, so what happens? So this has formed kind of a whole other chapter in my research, how these cosmic ray bottlenecks work. But the more general problem of how the turbulence and the tangling of a magnetic field in a galaxy cluster uh, impacts the particle population and the cosmic rays uh, is that kind of general topic is what Francisco is working on. 
So we're trying to understand how cosmic ray acceleration and propagation work in this type of environment. Okay, so that was kind of a whirlwind tour. Um, I, I hope I've convinced you that plasma astrophysics is, is a rich subject that contributes to the study of planets, stars, galaxies, intergalactic medium, pretty much everything. Um, and therefore, you will never run out of problems in plasma astrophysics. Um, I've been working in this subject for decades, and there's just always something new to interest me. And unlike an experimental plasma, um, the system that you study will never be shut down or, or canceled, although I did learn uh, the other day serendipitously that so this is not this is not purely a plasma problem but the the binary pulsar that's been allowing us to test general relativity so this is not a neutron star merger this is the pulse this is the two neutron stars orbiting each other been a great laboratory for general relativity but the pulsars have been precessing and this thing is going to disappear okay so it'll be beamed in some other direction some other civilization maybe we'll have the privilege of looking at it but it's going to be the end for us. But for the most part, the system you study will never be shut down or canceled. And you get to work on some of the most e extreme conditions and exotic forms of matter in the universe. And cosmic rays are just a great example of how these things play out. Uh, these, these tiny scales, this gyro resonance scattering on scales less than the size of the solar system produces effects on thousands of light year scales. And these thousand light year scale global situations feed back on the tiny scales and affect even something as fundamental as this gyro resonance scattering process. So it's a, it's a great multi-scale coupling across all scales. Very challenging, very interesting to me to work on. So thank you, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Ellen, for the very good presentation. Um, so we have a big audience, so everyone is welcome to ask questions. So in the in the meantime, uh, I may have uh, a question. So at some point in your talk, uh, you said that uh, we know that the acceleration has to be a one-time event, for instance, in our galaxy. And you, you, you didn't go much into details on that, but yeah, uh, yeah. suggested that, yeah. Okay, so the, the main way that we, that we identify how long cosmic rays have been in the galaxy is from their composition. So by and large, Cosmic ray, the, cos the composition of cosmic rays, so mostly protons, some helium, some heavy, he uh, heavier nuclei, it's very similar to the average composition of the interstellar medium. And this was actually a big surprise because it was, you know, it was conjectured very early on that cosmic rays and supernovae are associated. So the expectation was that cosmic rays would be very enriched in the so-called R process elements that form in the last stages of. Uh, stellar core collapse, but they're not. They're, so we, so cosmic rays, the cosmic ray acceleration process takes place in the interstellar medium and uses supernova energy. Now the carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen nuclei um, collide every now and then with interstellar protons, and they make light elements, lithium, beryllium, and boron. Now the lithium, now these are all very rare. Their cosmic composition is very low, and for lithium in particular, that's because lithium can fuse into heavier elements uh, at relatively low temperatures. It's destroyed very rapidly in stars. And so the cosmic abundance is very low. A little bit was made in the Big Bang and it's being eroded ever since, but cosmic rays are extremely enriched in lithium. It's many orders of magnitude higher abundance of lithium in cosmic rays than in the general interstellar medium. So the conventional explanation is that it's the result of, of fragmentation of heavier cosmic ray nuclei striking interstellar protons. So from the abundance of lithium, assuming that you started with essentially none, as a function of cosmic ray energy, 
we can infer how long cosmic rays have been confined to the galaxy. And what we find is that the confinement time is a decreasing function of energy. It goes like about the 0.3 to 0.5 power of, of energy. Now, if cosmic rays were accelerated continuously within the interstellar medium, you would expect that the most energetic cosmic rays are also the oldest, but it goes the other way. The most energetic cosmic rays appear to be the youngest, mm -hmm. the most recently formed. So that puts a limit on how much, I mean, you know, you can't say that there's no acceleration occurring in the interstellar medium. You can think of lots of ways this could occur, but by and large, there's a cap on it through this, this argument. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and this in, so, okay, so uh, Fernando Loon is raising his hand. So go ahead, Hi. Fernando. Yeah, I, I had a question about this mechanism you mentioned of particles being accelerated by going back and forth across a shock front. C could you elaborate a little bit on that mechanism? Yeah, actually, um, let me try to stop sharing and create a new slide and draw it. Um, let me try, let me, I don't know if this is gonna work. Um, actually, I don't know how to make it work, but, but the basic idea is, um, the basic idea is forget about the shock uh, and just imagine that you have a converging flow. So material coming from the right, coming from the left. Um, and that material is, is magnetized and it contains some scattering agent. And it, it can be, it doesn't have to be magnetic fluctuations. It could be, it could be anything, but it causes particles to be trapped in this converging flow. So every time the particle bounces off a wall that's approaching it, it gains some energy. And that, that, make, that does make sense, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so in shocks, the walls, if we go to the frame in which the shock is at rest, the walls are not exactly moving at the same speed. The wall that represents unshocked fluid is moving faster, that, which is approaching us, is moving faster than the wall that represents the shock fluid, which is receding from us. And so if we ask what the net energy change per loop is from two reflections, so one reflection from the incoming, where you, you pick up an energy uh, which is proportional to the velocity in, it's actually two P momentum dotted with V for the wall. So that's a gain. And then the loss is minus two P dot V out. So because V in is bigger than V out and in the frame of the shock for a strong shock V in is about four times V out, um, there will be a net energy gain per loop. Okay, thank is you. That, okay, yeah, that's a, I should have spent more time on that. Um, more it's a great process. Are there more questions? Um, so I may have a, okay, here in the chat. So there is a, another question, Ellen. It says, uh, what other scientific questions do you have about astrophysical plasmas to investigate? Oh boy. Um, okay, so if I could take a pill of immortality, um, I would like to know how the universe was magnetized because we don't think that magnetic fields, if Maxwell's equations are as we think they are, uh, magnetic fields were not created in the Big Bang. They arose subsequently through some kind of process. And there are basically two classes of process that people have investigated. So one is kind of a top-down process where a magnetic field was created everywhere. So for example, there are theories for the creation of magnetic fields during inflation, and they're not very predictive. They're, the strength of the field uh, varies with uh, assumptions by unfortunately about 50 orders of magnitude. Okay, so this is terrible, but still they might've arisen during inflation. The other kind of theory is a sort of a bottom-up theory which says that magnetic fields originated in relatively small objects like stars, and um, they were then propagated 
to great scales. So for example, Martin Rees said, well, so there's, there've been, there've been a hundred million supernovae in our galaxy and about 1% of them are like the crab and the crab nebula is about two parsecs in size and the magnetic field is about a milligauss. So suppose you took a million crab nebulas and spread them out to, inter to the current interstellar density, what kind of field would you have? Well, it turns out you would have a magnetic field that's about 1% of the magnetic field that, that we have in the galaxy today. And it would be very unlike it. For example, it would be completely incoherent. However, that field could then be picked up and worked on by a galactic dynamo, which is the key ingredients of which are probably the rotation, the differential rotation of the galaxy and the Oops. So I'd love to understand that better. And I'd love to understand kind of where the came from. And prediction of the top down theories is that there be a pervasive uh, So far, we really have evidence for that. Like a pill of immortality and, and, and have it work out better than uh, it has for some mythical creatures that asked to be immortal and became horribly old. Um, if I could be not only immortal, but in decent health, that's what I'd love to do. <laughs> okay. Similar to Alfen theory of ambiplasma or not? Um, Alfen, I'm not sure I understand that question. Could you um, elaborate? Me neither, Eduardo. Uh, right, it's, it, it's, in, it's in English. Okay, go ahead. Sí. Um, es si esta forma de estudiar el origen cosmológico de la magnetización de, de, del, del universo es similar a la idea de la teoría del BEM del ambiplasma. Well, uh, Eduardo is referring to a theory by Alfen called the theory of ambiplasma. Does it sound familiar yeah. to you? Well, as a matter of fact, um, possibly. So when I was a kid, um, Alfane had a, well, he has the book. It was a popular book called Worlds Anti-Worlds about, so it was about the question of whether there's really more of one kind of matter versus antimatter in the universe. Is that, can you see if I'm on the right track with this? Is this, is this kind of what you're talking about? Yes, that, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so I love the book actually. It, um, It, it posited that, that there would be kind of, because whichever form of matter is more prevalent uh, will eventually annihilate the other form of matter. It kind of posited that the universe was um, divided into these kind of random domains where you had you know, one kind of matter in one and the, the other kind of matter in the other, and that there would, be, there would be walls kind of between them where there was all this action, all this annihilation action. Um, Because the two forms of matter radiate in essentially the same way, uh, we have no direct evidence for or against this theory, except that these, that these layers have not been identified. And of course, um, so I've not gone back to that book as an adult um, and you know, tried to evaluate whether I think it's correct. But um, I think if I understand what you mean, um, That's, I, I'm not sure how that would be connected to an intergalactic magnetic field. Okay. Uh, it doesn't seem that there are more questions. So uh, I would like to thank you again, Ellen. Yeah, it was a very nice talk. Oh, thank um, you for the invitation. Sure. Yeah, yeah. It was a pleasure to, to talk about these topics. I don't have, I, I would have liked to speak a little bit more, but. Uh, I think we are past the time. So thank you. Thank you, Ellen, and see you soon. Yeah. All right. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone, Thanks. for coming. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.